tiny in all that air. The Philip Larkin Society Podcast. Hello and welcome to this special edition of Tiny in All That Air. As you may know, we have now released eight full-length episodes and we had episodes in production with three more future guests when the coronavirus turned life as we know it upside down. So we felt it was really important that we address this because we don't work in a vacuum. Many people have found both poetry and podcasts a great comfort in this time of isolation, including myself, and with Philip Larkin being the Poet Laureate of Social Isolation, we knew he'd have some great poems we could discuss. My guest today is Dr. Kyra Piperides jakes who you'll recognise from the Taster episode. Kyra is a trustee of the committee and co-edits our journal about Larkin. Today's podcast begins with me reading Best Society. Larkin wrote this poem in the early 1950s when he was living in Belfast, and he chose not to publish it at the time. It was subsequently unpublished until Anthony Thwaites' collected poems was released in 1988. Best Society by Philip Larkin. When I was a child, I thought casually that solitude never needed to be sought. Something everybody had, like nakedness. It lay at hand, not specially right or specially wrong, a plentiful and obvious thing, not at all hard to understand. Then, after twenty, it became at once more difficult to get and more desired, though all the same more undesirable, for what you are alone has to achieve the rank of fact to be expressed in terms of others, or it's just a compensating make-believe. Much better staying company. To love, you must have someone else. Giving requires a legatee. Good neighbours need whole parishfuls of folk to do it on. In short, our virtues are all social. If deprived of solitude you chafe, it's clear you're not the virtuous sort. Viciously then, I lock my door. The gas fire breathes. The wind outside ushers in evening rain. Once more, uncontradicting solitude supports me on its giant palm. And like a sea anemone or simple snail, there cautiously unfolds, emerges what I am. So I think, uh, although it wasn't published in his lifetime, It's a lovely poem to read at the moment in our time of enforced solitude for a lot of us. It really is. It's it's a beautiful poem. And if I wish, I do wish I'd known about it before. It's it's really interesting. Yeah, and I really love the imagery of the sea anemone and the simple snail. And the giant palm. The giant palm. Because the palm is a real symbol of kind of... uh, strength and being held up you know it's quite a religious image almost isn't it yeah you know you see it in buddhist texts and buddhist pictures and you see it in in christian imagery christ holding out his hand and holding your palm upwards is a sign of peace isn't it we put a tweet about it on our um, the society twitter account and i think people responded really strongly to it those those last words yeah. And, uh, you know, seeing enemies and snails are quite exotic in Philip Larkin's kind of world. <laughs> I don't know. And <laughs> seeing enemies, I don't associate with, with Philip no. Larkin. They're, but they're really brightly coloured and, um, you know, there's something about that kind of um, how they, they open up and they and they present themselves so beautifully. I think the, the word is cautiously, isn't it? I think it's really, they are, they strike me as kind of cautious, cautious animals, that and the snail. Yeah, because a snail, uh, you know, it's a self-contained being, isn't it? Yeah. That carries everything it needs within it. I like the idea of the safety of being indoors and it's yeah. it's windy outside, it's raining outside, but you've got the gas fire and you're safe and the door's locked and you can just become yourself. And uh, I do sort of wonder in these days of being indoors, I think a lot of us are probably thinking about, you know, who who are we? Like, if you can't just go out and distract yourself with shopping and going to the pub and going to the theatre or anything else that you might do, we've got a lot of time to sit, sit at home and, and think about what's important. 
I think it's kind of really interesting that there's this almost sort of shame in this poem of the idea of finding freedom behind the locked door. It's kind of, it's the word in the stanza is uncontradicting, but it is this contradictory imagery of only being free when you're kind of imprisoned yourself, when you're inside this snail shell or behind the locked door. It's really interesting. It is, and and uh, the previous stanza, he talks about how our virtue is judged by how we interact with other people and um, to be a good person, like a good neighbour, you need to have a parish full of neighbours. And I think it's quite interesting that he uses that word parish because, again, there's a mm. religious connotation to that. And we often say about people, oh, you know, he's a big part of the community. He'll always stop and have a chat. He'll do anything for anyone. And we do judge people very much about how we interact with other people. Yeah. Um, and we, we prize community-minded people as perhaps the best kind of people. And he says, well, if you don't like that, does that make you a bad person? You're not the virtuous sort. And uh, he uses the word viciously in that kind of old-fashioned way, the original meaning of, of the vice, the vice of yeah. um, solitude that he craves. And he says, but this is who I need to be. And I suppose for a lot of writers, that's exactly the same. That's the whole contradiction of being a writer, isn't it, that you... You're communicating with the world through your writing, but you have to do it in a solitary way. You have to be selfish. You have to lock yourself away from the world. It's quite interesting as well in this, because I guess looking on it now from 2020, we have this whole understanding of kind of self-care. And this is this is a great poem for me as a, as a sort of introvert, because sometimes you need that time on your own. Yeah. Yeah, this whole idea of defining yourself in terms of interaction with others, that's exhausting. That's really, yeah. <laughs> really tiring. And and do you find your um, enforced kind of lack of interaction at the moment during our lockdown time, are you finding that there's something beneficial for you about that? It's just nice to have time, you know? Yeah. And then when you're interacting with people, you're interacting with them on your own terms rather than... You know, that really awkward thing when you're in the supermarket and you see someone you know and you you just kind of don't really know how to react and it's just incredibly awkward. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't happen when you're in the house no. on your own. <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's, it's you know, this is a pretty terrible time for mm. for us all. It's a, it's a horrendous time that we're all going through. But I, I appreciate what you're saying about having time and all the distractions that we'd normally have. I mean, I've realised... The amount of times I go out to the shops and spend money is actually yeah. just ridiculous when I actually don't need to because I haven't done that for a week or two. But I bet if in normal day-to-day -day circumstances, I'd have been in and out of the shops loads by now. It really is a distraction. And isn't it strange, all the kind of ingredients at the back of your cupboard that you can actually use when you need to use them? Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. Ordinarily, you go, no, I'm not, not eating that. <laughs> no chance. Um. Larkin wrote this poem in 1950 when he was in Belfast and it was a really busy time for him and for him to, to get time to himself was really prized time for him. He was in the middle of three, he had three girlfriends at the time, mm. uh, which wasn't unusual for him. <laughs> but he had uh, Monica and there was Patsy, uh, Patsy Strang and Winifred Arnott and he'd obviously just come to the end of his engagement his relationship with Ruth so his life was as always quite tangled and quite busy and I, I think you know he really craved that time for himself mm. um, and I was reading the letters that he wrote to Monica around about that time when he was in Belfast and uh, I found a really nice quote in one of the letters who says, if the frosted, artificially sealed bivalve behaviour of my life is fissured, disquieting fumes of emotion rise through the cracks. And so he describes himself like a bivalve, you know, like a kind of mollusk or a yeah. oyster or something like that. So he's really got this uh, this idea of like being a little creature. And he did often compare himself, didn't he, in, in his uh, letters and cartoons to a kind of creature. You know, Monica was like the rabbit. So he had this kind of quite visual awareness of himself mm. as being this little 
secretive creature that likes to tuck itself away. Again, like like the sea anemone. You know, he needed that privacy to write. But then when you get later into the later poems, when you look at poems like Mr. Bleeny, sometimes that uh, being tucked away from society can, you know, he, it's not as comfortable. I think there's something in best society where he feels very comfortable, it's very celebratory. But uh, in later poems, there's an awkwardness about that, I guess maybe as he kind of realises he could never really get that kind of ideal social isolation that he wants in his life. Yeah, that kind of that links really interestingly, actually, to um, to the end of here, where there's this sense of clarification that is found by being distant from society. Yeah, that, that final stanza. Yeah. Do you want to read it out? Yeah, I've got it here somewhere. There it is. Yeah, the final, final stanza of here. Loneliness clarifies. Here, silence stands like heat. Here, leaves unnoticed thicken. Hidden weed flower, neglected waters quicken. Luminously peopled air ascends. And past the poppies, bluish neutral distance ends the land suddenly beyond a beach of shapes and shingle. Here is unfenced existence, facing the sun, untalkative, out of reach. I think there's, there's a real kind of reflective element there. This is probably one of my, one of my favourite stanzas of Larkin. Mm. And every time I look at it, I get something, something different out of it. But there is just this sense, of, this sense of clarity from the fact that the luminously peopled air ascends. So the, all the society has, and the kind of hustle and bustle of the city life that we see earlier in the poem is just lifted away. And here in nature, just kind of looking, looking out towards the sea is this clarity. Yeah, and you can... Being on your own outdoors is different from being on your own indoors, isn't mm. it? I guess there's no there's no moral judgment against walking around on the edge of the coastline or on a beach or something on your own. Perhaps that's slightly different from locking yourself away in your own room on your own. Yeah, it's the unfenced existence, isn't it? Yeah. It's, I guess it's some endless possibilities. And facing the sun... You know, the sun comes up quite a lot in Larkin, doesn't it? He, you know, yeah. And, you know, he wrote the poem Solar, and he's uh, very celebratory of nature and the sun in a mm. way that people don't always associate with Larkin because we often associate him with the, the sort of poet of, uh, I don't know, criticising society and being a little bit yeah. kind of locked away. But his poetry of of nature and of the life in nature, it's often very revelatory to people that yeah. haven't haven't come across it before which is one of the reasons why we wanted to talk about the spring poems because obviously Larkin isn't just a poet of social isolation he's also the poet of spring in lots of ways uh you were going to talk about the trees and coming yeah I think I think probably coming first yeah this is another poem that I just hadn't really ever focused on but like here there's this this kind of beauty and the nature that he finds in the poem so i'll read it out coming by philip larkin on longer evenings light chill and yellow bathes the serene foreheads of houses a thrush sings laurel surrounded in the deep bare garden its fresh peeled voice astonishing the brickwork it will be spring soon and i whose childhood is a forgotten boredom feel like a child who comes on a scene of adult reconciling and can understand nothing but the unusual laughter and starts to be happy. Yeah, it's just where we are at the moment, isn't it? The longer it really evenings, is. the yellow light. We actually had, we've had two thrushes in our garden today and I don't remember the last time we saw any thrushes. Oh, really? Uh, so I was really excited because I knew we were going to be talking about this poem this evening. It's like, oh, there's a thrush in the garden. That's um, fantastic. And yeah. that, it's, this, this idea, this has a new resonance for me because this idea of its fresh peeled voice astonishing the brickwork it's kind of as echoes of like right now in this in this unpeopled society we live in. People are talking about being able to hear the birds sing again. Yeah, yeah, you really can. And Gavin this morning was saying he felt there's so many birds coming into our garden at the moment. It's only little, and it's right in the centre of Sheffield. We do put bird feed out and stuff like that, but it just seems to be more and more birds and different yeah. kinds of birds coming in, and almost as if the animals are very quickly starting to refill the spaces yeah. that we've left for them. I read an article this morning about how um, moles are becoming visible again. Really? Like they're coming up above, above Earth to get their worms. 
just in the last few weeks. Yeah. Wow. And I, I read about in um, Venice, you could see dolphins. Yeah. In the water. It's incredible. Um, and it, I think it really shows this power of nature that I'm beginning to find in Larkin. I wrote about it in Ted Hughes a long time. Well, yeah, a few years ago. And I'm beginning to find it in Larkin. It's this kind of power of nature to restore itself and to undo all the like incessant damage that people do to it. Obviously, it only goes so far, but it's it's amazing how it's healing just from, what, three weeks of us, well, two weeks of us not being outside. It does make you wonder if, could we really go back to just exactly where we were before? You know, do we really want to do that? Do we really want yeah. to go back to damaging the world? Um, or maybe we could actually take this as a, a chance to totally put the world to right again. Yeah, I think that takes you back to your best society because I was I was just reading, you know, at the end of the Archie Burnett um, edition. Yeah. He finds this uh, letter um, from Black into Monica um, that says, silence is nearly a necessity, that blessed state in which very slowly one's mind can emerge from its shell like a tender snail, mm. which is really beautiful and links to that imagery. And then he picks out... Um, in in Paradise Lost, the line for solitude sometimes is best society, oh, and right. so you like you have to really really hope that coming out of this we can be a better society and we can use this time reflectively that we find the best part of ourselves. Yeah, when we have a little bit of this solitude, you know, it's in, enforced, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, that, yeah, it gives you this time to reflect. Yeah, that we just don't get to do. It just reminded me as well of the poem in um, High Windows, Going, Going, because written in the early 70s, yeah. Larkin did have that premonition about the world. You know, it's a poem about pollution, isn't it? And about losing the natural world. Um, and he says in it, things are tougher than we are. And you think, yeah, hopefully the, maybe the world will kind of respond, you know, and, and recover. Because he's very worried in that poem that he says, you know, that will be England gone. Yeah. And he talks about, you know, the kind of world disappearing that we know. And that poem, I know people have talked about it in terms of Brexit as well. Uh, I've seen that poem being quoted. Yeah. Because um, Best Society, although it wasn't published in his lifetime, it would have been written at the same sort of time as, as Come In and uh, would have been in The Less Deceived if it was going to be in a contemporary collection from when it was written. And that earlier Larkin does have those kind of, uh, uh, you know, I was wondering about, it was a kind of the sort of pre-movement poems where the that um, sort of more sardonic voice of Larkin hadn't quite come through. Because obviously in the North Ship as well, you don't get the voice in the North Ship of, um, you know, the Larkin from something like, say, uh, Toads or somebody like that, the, mm -hmm. the, the self-aware Larkin. So something like Best Society, although there is a first-person voice, it does have that kind of delicacy. There's there's no kind of sense of the fickleness of, of what he's writing about. And when he revisits the same theme, if you, if you argue that Verda Society in High Windows is kind of revisiting the same uh, thoughts about not wanting to be in pointless public engagements, for example, and wanting to be better at home, there's a sense of sort of self-parody in Verde society because in Verde society they just end up going to the party anyway. He just gives up trying to fight, and it's quite funny, you know. And the, and the the character that he writes to Mr. Warlock Williams and all that, you know, there's a there's a lot of kind of self-parody and humour that there isn't in Best Society. But in Tolly, uh, I was reading um, Tolly's book, and he was saying about. Uh, the movement poems being what he calls deflative of received pieties and not uh, the received piety in um, best society is that you're at your best when you're going out and helping other people and being with other people. Mm -hmm. So there is that aspect of Larkin that goes all the way through. And as we know, he, he, he challenges everything. He challenges religion all the way through his poems. He challenges perceived ways of living. He challenges, you know, like in uh, This Be The Verse, how we should think about our family and our parents, etc. But uh, 
you know, in best society, it's done in a much more gentle way, isn't it? In a much more sort of yeah. tender way. And a poem like Coming, I, you know, I love that imagery in Coming about, um, well, for, for a start, the, the childhood being the forgotten boredom. That's often, I think, a bit sort of misquoted. Yeah. Would you say when you know, when you learn more about uh, Larkin's childhood and his family, it's not, it wasn't as terrible as that, was it, really? No. But I think this stanza really is quite beautiful and it links into this sort of cyclicality that you can find in the seasons in Larkin. And I kind of, I read through as the childhood is a forgotten burden. I read it as kind of, it's the past, it's like last year, it's the winter, it's been a long winter. He's like really separate from his youth now. It's been a long winter, but now he's come back into this spring and he's rediscovering this kind of innocence and kind of childish Childish happiness. Yeah. And the hap- uh, adult reconciling, does that, is that kind of like a sort of a unity after conflict, something like that? That kind oh, yeah. of, that he can't quite understand. There's a kind of conflict, but now there's laughter and happiness once again. So it's a really kind of quite mysterious poem, isn't it? Yeah. And it's not easy just to sort of pin down, especially when you begin with just that very, visual and kind of lyrical description of the the thrush and the yellow light it becomes quite philosophical doesn't it yeah and quite kind of symbolic but it not in a it's not in now this symbolizes that kind of easy to pin down but uh, it kind of goes you know in a more mystical way i kind of i really connect to this imagery because like i don't know if this is a universal thing but like in springtime, I really, I kind of do feel like really happy because there's this, there's this sense of potential and there is this kind of rebirth and innocence imagery because you think of like spring lambs and stuff like that. Yeah. But I kind of just, just kind of remember kind of being sat at school in my history teacher's classroom, like gazing out of the window into this like beautiful springtime skies. And I kind of just reflect on that feeling. It is, I think it is, it's a feeling of potential because you don't know what the year has to hold yeah it's kind of a little grim right now but we can look out into the spring and the world is kind of it's like changing and like we will get to go out in that soon i think it's it's beautiful that it's just kind of carrying on nature's continuing like like the nature that is like unaffected by city life at the end of here mm. um yeah it's it's doing its own thing um yeah the nearest you get to that is the kind of brickwork in the garden and the houses, but the thrushes at the centre of that, the thrush is the important part of that. And even the, the deep bare garden, like it's obviously, it's had a harsh winter, there's nothing there, everything's been harvested, but mm. it's it's a deep garden, it's it's like fertile and it has this potential. It's going to grow, grow lots of vegetables for us this year. And then obviously the trees then, that is from High Windows, that is one of his later poems. And so he's still, although High Windows is often sort of characterised as the collection of death, really, and, you know, his his darkest sort of collection of poems yeah. and ill health and uh, decay and sort of decline, which we didn't really, you know, we didn't want to look at today yeah. in any great detail. And, we've, and, you know, we've looked at some of those other poems in uh, other podcasts. But in the, in the middle of it, we do have The Trees, which has got its... Um, it's got its sombre side to it. Yeah, we can't get away from the, the no. kind of darkness entirely. But No, no. So do you want, do you want to read The Trees? I will. The Trees by Philip Larkin. The trees are coming into leaf, like something almost being said. The recent buds relax and spread. Their greenness is a kind of grief. Is it that they are born again and we grow old? No, they die too. Their yearly trick of looking new is written down in rings of grain. Yet still the unresting castles thresh, in full-grown thickness every May. Last year is dead, they seem to say. Begin afresh, afresh, afresh. That last line is just... A lot of people tell, you know, say to me that's kind of one of their favourite lines. Yeah, yeah. In the whole of Larkin. And we nearly had that on the uh, plaque in Westminster Abbey. That was one of the oh, really? suggestions. Yeah. I think because it just wasn't quite as well known as the final lines from an Arundel tomb. Yeah, yeah. But it would have been a beautiful, beautiful epitaph for him. So, And also just says something about Larkin that isn't always 
seen in Larkin, you know, that that beautiful positivity there. Um, I think that's a, a very striking line. Their greenness is a kind of grief. Yeah. And I guess it's it's just more of this cyclicality, isn't it? Yeah. It's, you kind of, you build on, you build on what has come before you. It's this reflectiveness that is in the in the rings of grain as well. Mm. It can only get bigger by time passing and the different cycles of the tree passing. And their death every year. Yeah. And I know uh, people say, oh, the trees haven't actually died in the winter. They're not actually dead. They're just going dormant and that's part of their life. It depends if you think of the life as the tree itself or as each leaf. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, where is the life in the tree? And this reminds me of sort of Larkin not wanting to avoid death, you know, and saying, well, death is an integral part of the tree's yeah. life cycle. And that's and that's a beautiful, it's integral and it's part of the tree and it's part of the tree's beauty. It allows it to build on again next year and begin begin yeah. again. Yeah, because if, we, if it didn't die in the winter, we wouldn't have spring, we wouldn't have that yeah. magnificent kind of freshness and greenness that we... You drink it in, don't you, when you go into the park? I mean, just now that all the blossoms are coming out, the cherry blossoms. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when it's a blue sky and you've got those those blossoms up against the sky, you, you just absolutely drink it in, don't you? you? Just We just need that refreshing, yes, and that life. I have this, I have this really kind of sad, almost irony, that I have these two really beautiful blossom trees on my driveway, a pink one and a white one. Yeah. And the pink one always has finished flowering, like literally days before the white one starts flowering. And it's how beautiful would it be if the two blossom trees were both in flower at the same time. But it's (laughs) it's almost like that one has to has to kind of shed all its blossom before I can appreciate the beauty of the next one. So which one have you got at the moment? The white one? The white one, yeah. The pink one is sadly gone. Um, oh right, so the pink's been and gone. Yeah, that right. that when actually that finished just before uh, we started social distancing. Okay, uh, very strange that we've got a lovely white one out in the park across. I can just about see out to the window. Then I think as the white starts to go, the the rest of the trees will really start to get their leaves because they haven't yeah. really got them yet at the moment. Um, but they'll they'll start to grow, and I've really found. This I know it's only been a week and a half, or whatever, of social distancing so far as we're recording. But being out in the garden and and planting seeds, I've done more of that this year than I did last year. Yeah. Um, and it's really just just helpful to remind you of what's you know things are going to grow and things are going to be good and good things will come out of this difficult period as That's well. It. And we will, you know, maybe afresh for all of us. So the trees is a is a great poem for this this period, this strange social isolation <laughs> time. Um, it's a really great choice. So shall we end with high windows? Yeah. Rather than words comes the thought of high windows, the sun comprehending glass, and beyond it the deep blue air that shows nothing and is nowhere and is endless. And I think that's really beautiful. Um, I've read people finding it quite a kind of harrowing image or kind of a negative, but I, I can only see positive in it. And yeah, like I see this idea of looking into the blue sky from my uh, history classroom when I obviously wasn't paying attention um, <laughs> in secondary school. The endlessness is, is, a, is a potential. It's, it's endless possibilities. I just think it's it's a really really lovely image. Yeah, and it, and it takes us beyond words. Um, yeah. Which for a writer like Philip Larkin to take us into that world where words don't even exist anymore, just thoughts and just blue and just sky, especially when we start that poem with you know the couple and the the pills and the diaphragm and all yeah. the kind of very earthy human behaviour. And at the and end, then suddenly it just transcends human society, doesn't it? Yeah, we're just gazing out of the windows. And uh, by by the time Larkin had written this poem, or, or actually by the end of his life anyway, and he'd moved out of the house, the flat with the high windows. And uh, when he moved into the 
the house in uh, is it Newland Avenue. Oh, Newland Park. Newland Park, sorry, yeah. He didn't have anything, windows like that to look out of. It, you know, the, mm. the upstairs flat at Pearson Park was so important to him. It nourished him so much. And I think you can tell from this image. I think nourishing is exactly the right word. The sun comprehending glass. It's a very um, beautiful image, the idea of the glass actually being part of this. It's not just something you look through yeah. um, and ignore. It's actually integral that, that the windows are kind of the framing of this. So the, the uh, high windows are kind of like the human framework, if you like. Yeah. So he's not just standing in the street looking at the sky. It's, it's significant that he's actually looking through windows. And you can imagine in turn, there's this deep blue air that he's gazing out of. You can imagine in turn these sunbeams kind of just coming in through the windows. It's like the um, the shower at the end of with some weddings, you know, yeah. just something beautiful coming from the sky and just transforming uh, human life, Yeah, whatever we're doing, and making it magical, making it beautiful. So I hope, um, you know, our, our listeners kind of found that useful or just... Uh, a little bit of escape. A few people have said to me that, um, well, I don't know about you, I don't know how many podcasts you listen to, but I, I enjoy listening to podcasts. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Yeah, me too. And uh, I found some of the ones that I'm really familiar with as well have been the ones that have kept me going at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's an MR James podcast called um, A Podcast to the Curious. Okay. Um, which has been going a few years, actually, but I only discovered it uh, a month or two ago. And they go through all the M.R. James short stories and oh, um, wow. talk you through the plot and and all the kind of ideas behind it and the references and things like that. And that's great. I really like I really like listening mm. to them. They're quite funny as well, but clearly real admirers of James and just, you know, just doing yeah. it out of real kind of passion for M.R. James, which I think that's is, really nice. is really, really good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, podcasts have... Um, I think been a lot of consolation for people yeah, at the moment. Um, definitely really important for people, and I, you know, I feel very, uh, you know, grateful to the Philip Larkin Society that they uh, kind of let us go ahead with this, and you know, to our the uh, society members who you know have been so supportive of it as well. What are you going to do when you watch your watch your bucket list when you get out of, out of um... <laughs> the first thing when I get out? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, probably go down to the, there's a, a, a vegan kind of restaurant bar down the road called Ch yeah. uh, Church. So I can oh, actually amazing. say the first thing I'm going to do is go to church. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you to Kyra for joining me today. Thank you also to Professor James Booth for his support with the planning of this episode and his help in particular with Best Society. We will be releasing all of the podcasts that we recorded pre-coronavirus, as usual, over the next few months. And we are now developing a section on the Society website to include more notes about the podcast. So please keep an eye out for that. The best way to support this podcast is, as always, by becoming a member of the Philip Larkin Society, which you can join via our website. Thank you to all our members, listeners and Twitter followers. This podcast is produced by Simon Galloway, and the music is The Horns of the Morning by The Mechanicals Band. If you'd like to hear more of Wes Finch from The Mechanicals Band, he is currently live streaming music from his house every week on Facebook. You can also support him through Patreon. Thank you for listening, and if you have any comments or you're interested in being a guest, please get in touch. The horns of the morning Are blowing, are shining the meadow is wet with the coldest of dew.